Good morning to all colleagues from Bangladesh and India. I can see that some colleagues are still joining. So let's give it one more minute before we start. Okay, once again, good morning everyone and welcome to this online media workshop organized by the Internews Earth Journalism Network as part of its Bay of Bengal project for journalists in Bangladesh and in India. So our online media workshop theme has come out of our experience of working with journalists in this project for the last three years and more. We found that of the many stories that journalists from both Bangladesh and India did over these three years about the problems caused by climate change impacts in coastal communities, two issues stood out. Apart from the problems of the fishers who are facing the problem of fish moving away from the shore because of climate change. On the coast, where they live, where their families live, we found two very serious issues coming up repeatedly all along the coast, all the way from the Bangladesh coast to West Bengal, Odisha, Andhra, Tamil Nadu. These two problems are huge and they're common. One is the soil is turning so saline that crop farming is becoming almost impossible. The other is the water they use for drinking, cooking, washing is turning so saline that they're facing huge health impacts. So we thought that we should bring this experience together. And us journalists can listen to experts on these specific subjects to take this forward because it's quite obvious that there is a serious need to push the authorities to take steps for adaptation here. That is why we requested experts in this subject of how soil salinity and water salinity affects farming and how water salinity specifically affects health. And we are very glad that some very eminent experts have agreed to come and speak to us. I'm going to start by requesting Dr. Anwar Zahid, Director of Groundwater Hydrology in the Bangladesh Water Development Board to start 
with his presentation. Dr. Zaheed, over to you, sir. Uh, good morning, everyone. First of all, uh, thanks to the organizer for giving me the opportunity to share uh, our knowledge and experience uh, uh, with you. Uh, I am working in Bangladesh Water Development Board and in charge of groundwater hydrology. Our responsibility is to monitor uh, both water quality and quantity, monitor groundwater all over the country. And uh, in my presentation, uh, within first two, two, three minutes, uh, uh, I will present uh, why uh, salinity is important for us. So review of ground, groundwater or water resource development in country. And then uh, uh, I will present uh, what's the current situation regarding uh, salinity in our coast. So we all know that uh, we are struggling for securing sustainable water for all. So our government is also uh, are serious about that. And uh, in our Water Act, we have given priority that the portable or household use is the first priority and then food security and then environment and then for other users. And we know that uh, uh, Bangladesh is the lower most riparian country of the three mighty rivers, the Ganges, the Brahmaputra and the Meghna. So, and uh, uh, you know that uh, about 80% of the water from this catchment are flowing through Bangladesh during monsoon. So during monsoon, we get huge water and uh, about uh, 20 to 25% of our low elevated area submerged underwater, we call it seasonal flood. And sometimes we also suffer from large flood. So during monsoon, uh, we have no use of this huge water in many parts of the country. And because of huge population for growing uh, food production, uh, during dry period also we need to uh, produce more food and uh, during dry period we really suffer from the uh, availability of fresh and uh, safe uh, water resources. And in addition, you know, because of our geographic position, we also suffer from many different hydrometeorological uh, disasters uh, uh, like storm surges, uh, cyclones, uh, salinity in the coastal beds and etc. And obviously our coastal population is at high uh, risk of these uh, uh, disasters. And in Bangladesh, as I have mentioned, during dry period, we suffer from uh, the scarcity of uh, uh, water. So the farmers are becoming depending on groundwater resources. So for dry irrigation uh, period, uh, uh, groundwater is providing about 80% of uh, the irrigated water. And for drinking purpose, uh, we are almost 98% of water uh, are coming from uh, groundwater. So with time, number of uh, irrigation wells has been increasing tremendously. And because of uh, huge dependency on groundwater, we are facing both storage and quality problem uh, on groundwater. So Dhaka city and Barin area, because of uh, city abstraction, because of the irrigation obstruction, water table is declining in many areas. And obviously, you know that we suffer from uh, arsenic in shallow groundwater and uh, salinity in the upper uh, aquifer units in the coastal bed. So these are the major uh, uh, problems we are facing and also there are some other minor quality problems. So uh, our uh, aquifer system is very variable. Bangladesh uh, uh, is land of rivers and rivers are carrying sediments depositing and we, our landform is formed uh, mainly by these uh, rivers. So uh, the aquifer materials vary very uh, within very short distances. And if we consider our aquifer system down to 300, 350 uh, meters, so uh, in the coastal belt, if you we see this diagram, in the coastal belt, the upper aquifer groundwater contains salinity. And normally in the deep, deep aquifer, below 250 or 300 meters, we have uh, uh, generally fresh water. And that is mainly restricted for uh, drinking purpose. 
So as a monitoring agency, we monitor both groundwater quality and quantity all over the country since more than 50 uh, years. So we have extensive network of uh, groundwater wells throughout the country. Uh, these are the groundwater level contour maps for different depth levels in the coastal belt. And these are uh, some pictures uh, how we uh, monitor the salinity in the field. So if you see the regional, uh, this uh, salinity map, uh, uh, Bangladesh is the lower most riparian country and see our coastal belt uh, is significantly uh, affected by uh, the water salinity, both in groundwater and surface water basin. So from our one of our recent study, we have mapped the coastal aquifers depth wise. So you may consider 100 meter, 200 meter and 300 meter. And uh, these are maps for uh, monsoon and as well as for dry uh, period. So uh, you can see how the salinity has been uh, encroached uh, in our coastal belt. Obviously for the upper aquifers, even down to 200, 250 meters, uh, uh, the groundwater uh, contains uh, high salinity and in the deep, deeper aquifer, we generally get uh, fresh water. But even in deep aquifer, in many parts, mainly in the uh, central coast, uh, we have still high salinity. So the people from those areas are uh, extremely suffering uh, from availability of fresh water, both for their drinking and irrigation. So we have prepared different sorts of uh, uh, risk maps. So this is uh, again, one of our recent study and uh, uh, to prepare these risk maps, uh, we considered both the shortage of uh, uh, fresh water and as well as salinity and arsenic contamination. And if we consider arsenic and salinity, see the uh, huge part of the coastal region, the upper ground water is affected and uh, uh, the people are suffering largely from the availability of adequate fresh drinking water. And also irrigation is restricted there, mainly rain fed irrigation is common there as the shallow groundwater is contaminated mostly by salinity. So these are some figures from our study, how uh, the people are suffering uh, from the scarcity of water, as well as uh, many parameters in the coastal belt because of salinity, uh, like nitrate, like chloride, like uh, uh, chloride, these, these are very high in, in the coastal groundwater. So people are also suffering uh, from different health diseases. I, I am not a health professional, so health professional can say, but we can, uh, we can uh, provide the data what's the quality situation of the groundwater as well as surface water in the coastal belt of the country. So obviously we also assessed uh, uh, the water quality for irrigation and obviously we have found that electric conductivity, sodium absorption ratio, uh, these uh, uh, sorts of indexes uh, are in many places uh, high and unsuitable for irrigation purposes. So if we consider electric conductivity in many parts, in most parts, the shallow uh, groundwater has high uh, uh, electric conductivity, more than 2,000 microsiemens per centimeter. We know that uh, if it is within 1,000, we can call it fresh, good for health. Even up to 2,000, people are accepting that and above 2000, we can't consider it uh, for drinking purpose. And for irrigation, uh, if it is more than uh, 2250, or uh, yeah, then uh, we are doubtful whether we should use it for irrigation or not. And in coastal part, the shallow and uh, groundwater, even down to the depth of 200 meter, uh, the EC is high to very high. And if, if we talk on surface water, again, obviously the surface water is also saline and uh, uh, we consider 19 of our uh, districts as coastal districts where there is influence of high tide and low tide. And if you see these maps, so uh, even the surface water of these 19 districts are more or less uh, affected by the saline. 
So we can't use this uh, surface water also for uh, irrigation during dry period. During monsoon, yeah, the river water in, in few places, we can use that for irrigation. So these are the chem chemical composition of river water. So if you see electric conductivity or chloride uh, to consider the salinity, so uh, these are very high even more than 5,000 are during uh, monsoon and during dry period. This is in some cases more than 57,000. This looks like uh, the brine water uh, in, in the river. So these are some uh, data I am not going to describe details. So river wise, uh, uh, the chemical composition of this uh, surface water and obviously uh, unsuitable for irrigation water. And we also conducted some model study to see what the impact of uh, climate change, the impact of sea level rise, the impact of shifting irrigation wells from shallow aquifer to deeper aquifer. And we have found that if we um, continue our irrigation from the upper uh, aquifer, uh, then uh, the deep ground water will uh, remain safe for longer period. Your time, so mainly for drinking water supply. And as the travel time or age of the deep groundwater is very high, more than 100 to thousands of years, so uh, we are not allowing farmers to abstract deep groundwater for irrigation purposes. And regarding sea level uh, change, we are also conducting some study whether there is a land subsidence or sea level rise because to quantify the sea level rise is important, actual sea level rise is important. If sea level really uh, rises, then obviously the encroachment of salinity will be aggravated in future. So as we are suffering for, from the scarcity of uh, uh, fresh and safe water, so it is uh, the prime time for us to go for the water budget to see what resources we have to see what uh, uh, demand we have, and then we can go for the water allocation. And also, these are some uh, uh, okay mitigation measures uh, uh, I am talking about. We can also go for the uh, managed aquifer research in the coastal belt to reduce the salinity level in the very shallow uh, groundwater, mainly to provide drinking uh, water. But also, we can go for small scale irrigation uh, by doing the uh, managed aquifer research. And as time is short, I will not take uh, more minutes. So as coastal people are suffering, so they are trying to provide their uh, safe and fresh water by different means of technologies. So they are also using the surface water. So there are freezer ponds, and also they are using different technologies uh, uh, to remove the bacteria from the surface water bodies. And for drinking purpose, they also use deep groundwater. And uh, in our coastal belt, uh, uh, we know that in coastal belt salinity is a common phenomena. As groundwater table, because of huge abstraction of water, groundwater table, we are declining that. So the saline water is getting uh, more space to encroach both the uh, uh, surface water and groundwater basin. And also in our uh, coastal area, uh, the people are interested for stream cultivation. So they are inviting uh, saline or brackish water uh, even non-saline zones, and in such way, they are uh, contaminating both uh, soil and upper groundwater by salinity. So I think uh, I can stop here. Uh, in these slides, uh, uh, we have I have a few recommendations, including in our Delta plan. If anyone is interested, uh, we can see. And uh, if uh, there is any question, uh, uh, I shall be glad to respond. So I'd like to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Zahid. This was extremely rich, and I'm sure many of my colleagues are going, going to want a look at this in great detail. And over a long period of time, they would like to study this. And given that, I actually want to tell everybody that please, please uh, come 
with your questions in the q a box there is already a question in the q a box the top one for dr zahid i can see which he can answer later and for everybody please type in your answers in the q a box the way we are going to do this workshop today remember that we are first going to listen to the speakers while uh, please listen type in your questions and once the speakers uh, have made their presentations we shall have an open discussion which will include the questions and answers from the speakers at that time our software colleagues is are going to unmute everybody so we can all have a discussion and uh, at that time, I will request everybody to mute themselves unless they are speaking. Good. Having said this, uh, and I can see a, a request from one of the participants for the email IDs of the speakers. I shall ask all speakers for that. I really do hope that they will agree. And definitely, as long as they agree, we shall share their email ID so that you can get in touch. Now, let's move on to Dr. Bhiman Burman. He is the principal scientist of the Central Soil Salinity Research Institute of India, which is based in the Sundamans in Canning. So he is the one who actually is there and is looking at the soil salinity issues and how it affects agriculture and health. Over to you, Dr. Bowman. Thank you very much. Can you see, uh, see my presentation? Ye yes, yes, we can. So. Screen? Yes. OK. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and good morning to all the participants. Uh, I'll be talking about the coastal salinity, though the topic of the today's webinar mostly on the use of saline water in different sectors. Uh, maybe agriculture or health. But uh, coastal salinity, the word I have uh, uh, given here because it's very much related to, when I'm talking about the coastal salinity, with the soil salinity, it's uh, very much related to water salinity. So I'll be talking about how the salinity is developing in coastal area, what is the cause and the present status of the salinity and what is the how the salinity is going to uh, be there in future what is the scenario in future and what will the probable uh, means management option we, we those who are working in the field and the agriculture sector they may be knowing but as an art cell in the sort i would like to tell you the uh, some of the adaptation measures to manage the soil salinity or what is salinity in the most region so first, uh, I'd like to uh, share with you how the coastal salinization is happening, the major processes. First thing, we know that flooding of the saline water, the bleaching of the uh, embankment, particularly in the coastal area, we talk about in Bangladesh or India, it's happening during the cyclone and the And that saline water is entering into the uh, agriculture field and that is causing the high salinity. This happened in the past few cyclones uh, in, the, in our country and other in Bangladesh. Another uh, reasons for the developing salinity is there. We have the groundwater very near one layer of the groundwater very nearer to soil surface. There is very high salinity. And through capillary, the soil sal salinity is coming to the surface and depositing on the surface. And that's why when the dry season started, salinity is developing on the surface. But in the Caribbean, Caribbean season or in the monsoon season, uh, due to heavy rainfall, it's washed out. The scenario will be different. I'll be talking about how the dynamic, uh, uh, dynamic in the soil salinity in the soil surface. And if you see the Indian uh, scenario, we have total uh, uh, salt effect soil of 6.74 million hectare. Out of that, uh, 1.25 million hectare is the coastal saline, around 18.5% is the coastal saline soil. And 
we have the different categories of the soils like sodic soil, salt affected soil, sodic soil, saline soil. And in the coastal saline soil, we have the another category, the coastal soil, acid sulfate soil. They have the different properties, uh, problems of salinity as well as the acidity. So they need different management. Uh, I mean, uh, we have to go for different management practices uh, compared to the normal saline soil where not, uh, yeah, it means uh, abundance of the salt, like the sodium, potassium, calcium, of uh, sulfate and chloride is existing in the saline soil. But the sodic soil, they have the different problem with the soil, sodium salt, but mostly in the coastal part of the coastal salinity, uh, coastal areas, sodic soil is very, very less, but saline soil, where the different ionic composition of the salts are present here, along with the uh, acid sulfate soil. So if this is the uh, salinity, how is uh, happening. So if you see the groundwater quality in India in the coastal region, this is the map of the Neola color if you see in the coastal area throughout the Eastern coast, they have the problem of the salinity. Groundwater is having salinity already. In Bangladesh, we have just seen that there is a problem of salinity. And that salinity is having not only in the coastal area and other parts of the country, like the arid and semi-arid region particularly. So that water is made to be suitable for the agriculture purpose or irrigation purpose. If you see the Indian coastal uh, groundwater scenario of the West Bengal, uh, if you see that uh, uh, that uh, mostly the red color, this very saline water is very near to sea, and that is the reason for developing the salinity on the salt surface through capillary rise of plumbing. So, if you want to trap the fine, good quality water, they have farmers has to go to the deeper layer. Sometimes it not be economical for the farmers. So they mostly uh, but it uh, varies in different uh, depths in the coastal aquifers. And that's more, sometimes the farmers are using shallow groundwater, which is economical for the farming, farming, farming purpose. So sometimes they find problems of salinity or uh, in the even uh, shallow aquifer, they have to go to the deeper layer. Just want to give an example of they have collected some data of the farmer's bill. This is the uh, red color if you see with the grain yield of rice, how it is declining in salinity where soil, uh, shallow water tube they have used more than 91 meter, the water quality is uh, comparatively good. And they expected that they can get the better yield, but when they're using very uh, narrow, shallow depth at a less than 91, millimeter, 91 meter, so salinity is so high when they're using free water means every day for irrigation purpose, the soil the salt is depositing, so yield is declining. So this is the happening when we are using the groundwater, saline groundwater for agriculture. The example of the rice I have given here, it is applicable for the other crops also. Another uh, salinity development along with the, uh, the climatic hazards and all these things, the uh, groundwater the contribution and there's a brackish water fish farming already we have listened now uh, that from the Bangladesh also and that is one of the uh, reason for developing high salinity or uh, area of salinity is increasing the use of the brackish water or saline water for the stream cultivations and the what is happening when one farmer is using the saline water for the fish farming what adjoining area what happening? Rice due to seepage of water. They say, see, this is a, a brackish water. This a water is coming through seepage. And though farmers, though interested to grow the rice or other agriculture crop, they cannot grow. They have to go because slowly, slowly the water is coming through seepage and that water land is saline and crop is getting lost. So they have to, they bound to convert to the uh, means. Uh, uh, fish farming or they have to keep their run fallow. So this is the happening and uh, you know that we, you all are media person, that is the uh, means frequent problem of the I mean, conflict of agriculture and fisheries people in the coastal area in both in India and Bangladesh. This is another. Another climatic hazards definitely that is causing the land degradation in terms of the salinity development. Uh, you are already, we already know the eastern coast between Bay of Bengal having the more cyclonic uh, uh, storms happening compared to that. Uh, Western coast, and due to that, the there is a chance of less more degradation of the coastal land due to water logging, storm surface, and another is the uh, uh, this is the sea level rise. We have analyzed the 
permanent uh, data database of permanent service or mean sea level rise and we have seen that particularly shunarban area uh, sea level rise is annual changes you can see is more compared to the other eastern coast uh, i mean other station of the eastern coast or western coast only one or two areas in the western coast maybe uh, high uh, there is a more an uh, annual increase of sea level but overall eastern coast is more uh, vulnerable to sea, sea uh, level rise and sundarban is very very vulnerable to that one because of the different regions sea level and shrinking of the land mass of the sundarban this is one of the reason for the more we are witnessing more sudden in sea level rise in the country so when there is be more inundation through the sea due to sea level rise so we expect that there will be more salinization of the uh, land area so agriculture will be affected the if you see the river water quality one uh, uh, means uh, data i can show you that a study has been made how the surface water river water salinity in the coastal area I means particularly sundarban i given the example here in the sundarban uh, they are increasing in the particularly the western coast uh and eastern eastern side and uh, uh, western side of the sundarban the water salinity is uh, decreasing with uh, times but uh, western uh, central part of the sundarban the salinity of the surface river water is increasing they are due to you know there are a lot of changes in the rivers uh, river uh, siltation and the flow of the ganges has been diverted and the there is a lot of many many rivers are not uh, not getting the water from the uh, means uh, ganges or so the fresh water so backward flow of the water will be very very high that is the many many reasons of uh, uh, salinity surface water salinity changes in the happening in there and that is going to affect the soil salinity and ultimately the agriculture productions uh, we have recently studied the surface water quality of the sundarban area it's if you see pre monsoon season this is the green zone is with less saline but if you white versus white zone is Higher salinity. We saw that it is the pre-monsoon season, and monsoon season, though due to high rainfall, there is dilution of water. The salinity has increased, uh, which diluted some some parts of the Sundarban with river water quality. But overall, the saline surface water of the Sundarban, the river water cannot be used for the agriculture purposes. My one of my some of the my colleague, they are working in agriculture in this. Uh, they reported that some of the canal or the river. even they can use for the agriculture percent rice then but particularly in the sundarban area of indian uh, part of the sundarban in west bengal we cannot use for the uh, means uh, irrigation purpose so, so we are uh, uh, details we are studying this as we have started the work uh, how the salinity temporarily vary again how the farmers are using our, what is the adaptation capacity of coping strategy they have purpose they are studying that one and if you see the interesting part the la land use land classification uh, of the sundarban area if you compare the 1975 and 2015 see the aquaculture area, just by talking that one of the reasons for the salinity development in the coastal area has been increased and crop land uh, is increased the interesting thing is the fallow uh, area has been decreased uh, that is a very interesting thing more people are uh, now Uh, practicing the agriculture even in the dry season but due to the uh, increase of the area of the aquaculture um, aqua aquaculture uh, the salinity has been increased uh, but uh, uh, due to practice of the crop in the particular way uh, that area salinity has not much increased due to continuous cultivation of the crop and they are using the better quality water uh, through harvesting of the rain water and other method of using the water but in the where there is a more use of the aquaculture the salinity has been increased see if you see the 73 and uh, 90 2015 salinity how the uh, salinity has changed changes if the salinity area has been increased and there is a tree that area of saline area has been shifted some earlier this this area was not saline but now it has the salinity has been increased so this is the one uh, uh, that is the next side the uh, 
the what salinity is very much dependent on the water, the water flow of the water. Earlier I told that some of the river was carrying the better quality water. Now they have silted. No water is coming uh, there. Uh, so salinity has been increases. So based on this uh, means state data, how the salinity is changing and what area that they have shifting, we have to go for the planning purpose or the management practices or that. This is the trend that we have seen that salinity has been increases, particularly uh, this one example I have given in the uh, coastal Sundarban areas and, uh, and, and that shifting is also happening. Earlier, those uh, though area, the, the area where the salinity was not how high, now it has become very high. So, uh, vulnerability shown there by uh, it looks like uh, Dr. Berman may have, yeah, okay, he's back. Dr. Dr. Berman, will you please unmute yourself? You, I think you'll maybe we lost you for a minute. You are still muted, sir. Yeah, now you are unmuted. Excellent. There is okay. some today. We have some uh, network problem today. Yeah, I understand uh, that. Not a, not not a problem. We all face these. Uh, so okay, let's okay. go back to your presentation. Yeah, this is the uh, happening that in future we are expecting that more area will be inundation, will inundated due to sea level rise and and other climatic changes. So, uh, so now we we have seen that how the salinity changes and what is the factors responsible in the development of the salinity in the coastal area. But we consider the agriculture, there is a two distinct features of that salinity development or the salinity problems in the coastal area. We consider the two both seasons, Amun season or Karib season, Monsoon season, there is a not much problem of salinity unless there is no inundation through the breaching of the embankment or cycling storm is happening. Otherwise, whatever the salinity is developing in the Boro season or the Ravi season, they will be washed out. So, but the water logging is a main drainage condition, particularly, is a problem for that. So, farmers are growing for traditional or curry price, and uh, they sometimes they don't have may, may not be have the alternative though. But the uh, research is going on, a lot of varieties, particular rice is coming. Uh, so, mainly the Karib season, there is a deep water logging and reddish problem. But if you come to the Rabi season or Boro season, uh, it's a fresh water scarcity, though we have the lot of water rain that's coming through rainwater and um, along with the though it's not going to be available unless it's been stored in the farm level or other canal system or something like that but there is a uh, we can grow the crop on more control conditions so the yield or productivity of the crops or rice crop will be high but salinity is very very uh, higher in particular in the rabi season so if you the set see that this is the graphical presentation how the the salinity changing see blue color is depicting the water depth uh, of the field uh, how the water Dr. Dr. Burman, Dr. Burman, you are not yeah. sharing your uh, screen so we can't see your presentation now oh, will, you restart, will you restart your sharing please Yeah, it's perfect now. Now we can see. Yeah, so see, this is happening, uh, particularly if you uh, see, I would, uh, means uh, periodically how the water logging is changing. Uh, particularly, Kharif season, it will be very, very high, uh, around 60 centimeters on an average. Uh, 
uh, uh, water logging. But salinity is already I told is a very very high, particularly reaches maximum during the summer months, April May. But after when the rain started, it is slowly slowly de decreasing. It is generally happening in the same. So based on that uh, means dynamisms of how the salinity changes over the period of time, management actions options should be taken. So to so for the agriculture purpose the uh, management options for the do both the season is quite different so uh, in our cells i'll uh, just like to talk, tell you the some uh, major management option i'll not talk in the uh, in details uh, so for soil management aspect we have to go for the specific nutrient management aspect management because the I already told the two different uh, type of soil acid sulfate soil or saline soil acid sulfate soil having the problem of this phosphorus de de deficiency or toxicity of iron or aluminium because they, the soils have the property to fixing the phosphorus in this and the sequestration of the organic carbon is very very important for soil management and how to be reduce this build up all the technologies are available but at an art cell this is the areas where we can go for that uh, means management option and particularly crop yes we have to choose the soil tolerant crops or cultivar and crop diversification is very very required because the crop diversification or multiple crops has to be choose because the our area is very very vulnerable to climate change if there is any crop is uh, uh, damage is there so farmers can get some other means uh, some income from the other crop so crop diversification is very very important or cultivation of the major crop uh, so far the crop uh, selection is purpose uh, now the many many crops has having that can be grown like unia and then uh, salicornia and other non conventional crop they can tolerate high salinity so that can be where there we cannot manage the salinity we don't have the high saline um, we don't have the fresh water color we can grow those type of crops so water management definitely is a very very important aspect for the coastal region we should must have the uh, integrated water management practices and conjunctive use of our water based on the uh, because every crop has i'll show you an example of the rice crop uh, they have the different sensitive stage and the tolerance stage also based based on that stage of the crop we can uh, use the saline water or uh, in rotation or mixing of the water that is called the conjunctive use of saline water rain water harvesting is definitely was the one of the most sustainable technology for the coastal area because in the ravi season or dry season we don't have the fresh water quality fresh water for the irrigation purpose so along with that for the efficient use of the water we should must go for the modernized irrigation technique like the deep irrigation or the um, uh, subsurface even deep irrigation all these practices and sustainable land management practices land modification technique also you want to give an example for that where land can be modified so it can uh, the, uh, withstand the problems of the uh, problems of the uh, water logging and salinity and agroforestry for the diversification of the crops and all these things conservation agriculture and such along with that we must go for the risk management uh, of, uh, as, uh, aspects for that and along with that we must have I made resilient place concept as uh, where well farmers can participate for the integrated climate survey for agriculture. So rice, if you just give an example for the rice crop, say rice have the different sensitive stage, uh, like particularly early seedling stage and boot stage. They are very, very sensitive stage. So we should be very careful, or the farmers should be very careful. They should not use the saline water in the particular boot sensitive stage. Particular vegetable stage or tolerance and stilling stage, there is not. Uh, means uh, sensitive state there we can go for the uh, slightly saline water but rice is a not much very highly saline salt tolerant crop but do you have to very very careful the critical state like that rice crop we have to uh, see that other crop what are the sensitive stage and we should not use the sensitive uh, saline water in the sense so conjuncting use of the water while you're talking earlier just very very important this is the land modification technique where without land saving you can see and with land saving how it's happening where land has been modified and uh, where the uh, to just uh, uh, storing the water and cropping the growing the multiple crops and uh, throughout the year and there's a very very sustainable our institute has developed many many technology or models for the permanent adopted large scale along the coastal region even in the island system also uh, Andaman Nicobar islands where the after tsunami the land was very very saline in the there we adopted some of the 
models and the farmers are getting the very very remunerative crops so if you see the benefit of that uh, cropping sentence certification can be increased uh, because most of the land is become costly fallow because of the problem of the water salinity or water scarcity in ravi season so through this uh, model land modification model we can go for increase the cropping intensity we can harvest the rainwater so water can be used for the daily irrigation along with the fish that can be incorporated in the, in the pond and other channels where, so that farmers income can be generated and employment generation definitely generated and we have seen that income generation is very very high six to nine ten compared to the uh, rice fellow which is the traditional practice of the agriculture practice in the rain. and nutrient status and under other things will be increased to the continuous cultivation of the and we are measure of the greenhouse gas emission for the system and compare with the traditional system definitely greenhouse gas emission for this area so these are the very very integrated cultivation for uh, agriculture practices in the it is very very climate resilient uh, agriculture practices thank you very much uh, this is the not cell uh, how the salinity is changing and the, some of the management aspects in the coastal area thank you very much giving us me the opportunity for sharing my views my work we all agree with thank you very much thank you very much dr barman this again was an extremely rich presentation and we are right now all we are inundated with requests from all participants uh, for the copies of the presentations of all the speakers especially those speakers who have spoken already and their email ids uh, so that the journalists can get in touch with them later i i hope that uh, the, all the speakers will agree we'll get in touch with them directly for this and we shall definitely share with all participants anyway the recording will be shared and please remember that after the speakers we are going to talk, discuss story ideas arising out of all this between ourselves and we are going to discuss the story grant program so that these story ideas can be uh, can be used right uh, now we move to the specifically to the health issues and we start with my colleague dr jaya shridhar jaya over to you thanks so much jaili pai i'm just asking if everyone can hear me we can hear you and we can see your slide yes perfect perfect okay thank you very much uh, for those absolutely wonderful and interesting presentations with some great uh, uh, visuals as well um, it's it's a real eye opener and it's such a difficult story to tell this whole complex interplay of so many factors and their effect on human health so um, i think each of us is looking at a small piece of the puzzle and hopefully uh, we'll be able to do some synthesis at the end of the session so let me just quickly touch on just a few highlights uh, because the evidence is very patchy and then i'll uh, leave it to the discussion if that's okay with joydeep yeah so uh, so this is just a nasa photograph of where all that salt <laughs> in the ocean comes from and why we are seeing such a massive uh, incursion of uh, salinity into the coastal areas it's all coming from the earth and going back and coming back and uh, there have been quite a few media reports comparing salinity in the human body to salinity in the ocean and i was just thinking that journal as journalists i think we need to be clear about what we're reporting and don't compare ocean water and uh, the amount of sodium in the body and so on ocean waters have about 3 times as much sodium 5 times as much chlorine per unit weight 8 times as much calcium and 50 times as much magnesium so uh, this is something to remember not to make comparisons with sea water right we have about uh, uh, if you look at the elemental composition of the human body sodium is just like a looks like a minuscule percentage it's just about 0.2 but it plays a variety of important functions in the body and uh, uh, the two major ones are it helps to transmit nerve impulses helps to contract and relax the muscles of course it helps maintain the water homeostasis and our kidney plays a huge role because they essentially balance the amount of sodium which are stored in our bodies and uh, they are the underlying reason the whole water regulation sodium water interplay and osmosis essentially uh, paves the way 
towards maintaining uh, normal blood pressure in the body and hypertension is a result when this balance gets upset. So if there's not enough sodium and the kidneys cling on to the sodium, and if the sodium is too much, as is the case because of high levels of salinity in the drinking water, for instance, and from dietary intake, the kidneys will try to push the excess sodium out. And if they cannot do that because they are either diseased or compromised in other ways, or if the intake is too much, if the overload is too much, the sodium starts to build up in the blood. And as the sodium builds up in the blood, it's going to attract and hold water, which is going to put a pressure on our blood vessels, making the heart pump faster. And that's what really drives up the pressure in our blood vessels. So um, if, if there are pre-existing conditions, such as uh, chronic kidney diseases, for instance, or the person is already uh, having an underlying cardiac condition and lives in an area where there is a higher level of salinity in the groundwater, there is a disproportionate impact on the health of those people. So just a couple of basic slides. Well, the WHO recommends that we eat just less than a teaspoon of salt per day and that they recommend that we should fortify it with iodine. And uh, on average, most people can, uh, you know, consume about double that or nearly double to more than double that. So uh, there is enough evidence from all over the world that shows that if you consume less than a teaspoon per day, it can help to regulate the blood pressure uh, better, uh, reduce high blood pressure, and also um, uh, in turn reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease and stroke. And um, this is the public health implication because of the growing uh, number of people dying of cardiovascular diseases all over the world, particularly in Asian countries. Uh, the member states of the WHO have adopted a target of a 30% reduction in salt consumption by 2025 to prevent non-communicable diseases. And this is one of the reasons why the seminar is really important because we are talking about a long-term impact um, on health, on the health of people, uh, particularly in Asian countries in, in, such as India and Bangladesh, where the burden of non-communicable diseases has already overtaken the burden of infectious diseases. This is going to place a long-term, lifelong burden and impact on our already fragile health system. So it's something that we need to explore in detail. I just put this slide up here. This is a very popular slide. Many of you may have seen it, but this is just to give you a rough idea of the salt intake through diet um, you know, in India. And you can see that uh, there is a lot of, uh, you know, it's much, much over the WHO recommendation. And if you add to this, if you, uh, you know, sort of layer the existing salinity issue to this, where people don't really have a choice to access fresh water to drink on a daily basis, it's going to compound the problem. So we mostly get our salt from natural sources um, and also from home cooked food. The natural sources include a number of seafood and dairy, uh, you know, seafood, which, which is consumed uh, in quite a significant proportion along the coastal areas, particularly among the uh, certain communities. So there's already a lot of salt entering the body and uh, Contrary to popular opinion, it's not always processed foods that contribute a major share of the salt to the body. Sometimes, depending on community to community, it can also be home cooked food when uh, the person who's doing the cooking uh, adds on a liberal dash of salt in the cooking. So home cooked food is also an important source of uh, dietary salt and drinking water. So here, um, you know, uh, if the drinking water uh, sodium content is about 20 milligrams per liter. That is considered to be quite all right. And WHO really doesn't have a standard health-based uh, guideline for how much water, uh, salt there should be in the drinking water because the obsession is always with dietary salt through solid food. Uh, but just for a comparison, in Bangladesh, uh, studies show that there's a standard sodium content of about 600 milligrams per liter in the drinking water in those specific regions which are affected by salinity. So this is the uh, sort of uh, uh, contrast that we're seeing. And let me quickly jump into the health um, range of health effects that are associated with increased uh, exposure to salinity. You get it, you get increased sodium into your body by through the drinking water, also by uh, through cooking and also by bathing among, uh, you know, in the coastal populations. And through occupational exposure, mainly through shrimp farming, that's the one that's most uh, widely documented. And uh, the thing is, uh, the effects of the salinity contamination are more likely to be documented um, in those countries where salinity is not that much of a problem at all. 
it's only now there's a growing uh, body of researchers and scholarship that's looking at this problem in more depth as uh, you know, the understanding of climate change and its impact on coastal lives is uh, coming into the picture in a bigger way. So these are broadly, very quickly, the major um, effects of human exposure to saline water. There's cardiovascular illnesses, which is essentially diseases of the heart and the blood vessels. There can be abdominal issues, uh, such as a, a diarrhea, abdominal pain, and even a gastric ulcer, I'll explain in a minute. And then skin uh, dysentery and typhoid, and also skin diseases because of exposure to salt water. Take a look at this uh, uh, very colorful, it's, it's not a furry cushion. This is uh, something called the Salmonella typhi bacteria. And uh, this is the causative uh, germ of typhoid, which essentially is characterized by increased temperature. You may get a headache or a stomach pain and, or a constipation and a diarrhea. So just remember that some of these symptoms may be double counted when you're talking about the uh, studies that are looking at diarrhea is just a symptom. It could, the typhoid could be an underlying cause if it's not ruled out. So the diarrhea data associated with salinity in groundwater is always a little suspect. So look for, uh, you know, what the researchers are actually counting. And uh, the reason why I'm flagging this up is because typhoid is a transmissible disease. Um, and uh, unlike just, uh, you know, diarrhea due to excess salt, which could be due to other reasons, uh, compounded reasons, but this, and there are increasingly uh, drug resistant strains of typhoid, which could be uh, spread. This is another mm, lovely little uh, germ. It's called the Helicobacter pylori bacteria, and it's found in your, um, you know, where, in, in your uh, stomach. And this is the causative agent of uh, a major contributor to gastric ulcers. And this can, if, if there's an excessive concentration of salt in the stomach because of constant exposure, drinking saline water, high dietary intake, these little germs can multiply and they can uh, generally, they account for up to 90% to 80% of gastric ulcers. And that can go on to develop, uh, increase the risk of developing gastric cancer uh, by two to six fold along with other issues, right? So the next major um, and very widely documented health effect of salinity in groundwater is hypertension. And many of you may be familiar with the more recent guidelines that have revised what constitutes hypertension. It's been revised downward to about 130 by 80, which is something that most even uh, young people in their mid twenties to late twenties have this kind of a pressure in the Asian populations. And this calls for really better monitoring of your blood pressure. You don't have to wait till you're 40 to start monitoring it. You need to monitor it much earlier in order to uh, change your lifestyle and your dietary habits so that you can ward off cardiovascular illnesses. So in those coastal areas that have a very high salinity in drinking water, by high, I'm not quantifying it here. I'll get into that in a minute. Um, you know, uh, hypertension or high blood pressure is frequently associated over there. And uh, about uh, 20 million people in Bangladesh, according to uh, one study, 2006, this is an older study, but uh, are shown to be at higher risk of, were shown to be at higher risk of hypertension because of the climate change and the saline water intrusion triggered by it. So um, here, the, the higher the saline concentration, the greater the chances of being hypertensive. So you're seeing quite a positive gradient there. That's what I wanted to flag up. And um, the other thing the journalists could really do well to think about is that this whole gendered aspect to reporting on salinity and health, because salinity and health from available studies shows that there's a disproportionate uh, impact on women. You have a 31% higher chance if you're a woman to be developing blood pressure compared to your male counterparts. And then if you're older, if you're an older woman, 35 years and older, you have more than a, about a two and a half times higher risk and uh, this is associated differently with different levels of salinity in the water. So the higher the salinity in the water, the greater the risk. So this is, uh, you know, when you're doing these stories and then you're looking at people, women who are uh, forced to draw water for household cooking and drinking from deeper aquifer water, you'll find that possibly a higher level of hypertension associated among those groups, with those groups, right? And, uh, <clears throat> Why are we worried about uh, hypertension among women, particularly those in the uh, childbearing age? Globally, generally, the guideline is that there's about roughly a yardstick, rough crude figure is that about 10% of all pregnancies worldwide are complicated by hypertension. And that will have its adverse effect on both maternal 
and fetal health on both the health of the mom as well as the baby growing inside her. And two of the two uh, major issues that are associated with hypertension are preeclampsia and eclampsia. These have been sort of touched upon in the mainstream media reporting on salinity and uh, gender. Uh, preeclampsia is when the hypertension is serious enough to cause convulsions. Uh, and <clears throat> eclampsia is a much more rarer complication uh, where you have severe seizures and you have disturbed brain activity. And on occasion, if the, serious, uh, if the case is serious enough in order to save the life of the mom and the baby, sometimes uh, save the life of the mom, sometimes the baby uh, is, uh, you know, sort of taken out, has to be killed and taken out. So this is a, a huge, huge issue. Nowadays, there are better ways of managing is it, but this used to be the case about 30 years ago. And this drinking water salinity could be a major factor on infant and newborn death in coastal Bangladesh. We don't have enough data right now. There are enough preliminary data to suggest this, but we really need more studies on this. So just very quickly to touch on how exactly maternal and fetal health is affected by increased uh, salinity. There's decreased and, you know, and hypertension. You have less blood flow to the placenta because the blood vessels are constricted. And so the baby gets less oxygen and therefore few, fewer nutrients. So you might get babies whose growth is affected, growth is uh, restricted. So you will get babies of lower birth weight with all the attendant risks of uh, greater vulnerability to infection, breathing problems and other complications. And here, uh, you know, if, if a woman is uh, preeclamptic, that is if she has hypertension with some seizures, you know, the, there could be, the seizures could be uh, causing a separation of the placenta from the inner wall of the uterus, which can cause heavy bleeding and the person can hemorrhage to death if they're not attended to. So this is direct links to how many institutional births are happening along the coastal districts in the villages. Uh, and that's a really uh, key, uh, uh, you know, uh, something to follow as a story because it's so uh, clearly linked to maternal deaths and related to salinity. And then there could be injury to other organs because of hypertension to uh, all of these vital organs and uh, such as the brain, the heart and the lungs and the liver and it can threaten your life. Uh, premature delivery, of course. And not only that, this is a long-term implication throughout the life of the woman because there could be an increased risk of future cardiovascular diseases. Um, so um, this is something that I really wanted to um, ask the journalists to sort of think about and we can discuss this later. Uh, very often um, uh, studies on salinity and health will focus on two or three factors but I think that there needs to be a range of investigational reports that look at the multifactorial nature of the hypertension that's associated with salinity. So very often we, we won't find data about, okay, there's salinity in the groundwater, but what about their dietary intake? Was that taken into account when these uh, shocking data uh, you know, were reported? Uh, were the women overweight because of any other reason? Uh, you know, do they, and what about their genetic predisp uh, predisposition? And what about epigenetics, which is the way that certain genes are switched on and off, right? So these are all transmissible familial inherited traits that can actually have an effect on hypertension, whether somebody will become hypertensive or not. So here's another gendered aspect of uh, the health effect of salinity. Uh, women uh, who work in the shrimp farms, I mean, this has been quite widely reported, uh, you know, in, in several mainstream media outlets, where the women working in the shrimp farms who stand in the saline water for five to six to seven hours a day uh, end up with diarrhea because of the uh, contamination. They end up putting some of that water in their mouths, their skin rashes, itching and skin irritation. And uh, the more uneducated, the lower the level of literacy and self-esteem, the more likely they are to fall sick. And many of them sought uh, medication and treatment from um, the local quack or from the traditional healer. The other and probably the last health issue I would like to flag up is not uh, so much a, a direct effect, but this is an indirect effect where we're seeing the ability, the adaptation of uh, many of these disease-causing mosquitoes to sort of breed in brackish water, which, which wasn't the case earlier, but this is happening over a period of years. So their domain is essentially ex being extended uh, across several of the coastal areas and inward 
And so you find that, um, you know, there's this formidable list of diseases on your right, many of them killers, and that can seriously compromise the quality of life. You have malaria, Japanese encephalitis, um, and uh, these, uh, uh, and, and filariasis, and these, as, as the seawater levels go up and as salinity increases along the coastal areas, uh, the mosquito breeding domain spread, and there's a greater mosquito density, and with a rise in and the possible risk of a rise in these epidemics. I just want to, yeah, I think I'm almost at the end. Jaydeep, do I have time for just two more slides? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say that normally uh, we need to be a little careful. A lot of the documentation around salinity and the health effects of salinity are all based on observational research as it should be. And they give enough ballast for us to draw these very, very strong positive associations and correlations between salt and health. And uh, But just important to uh, mention that in the story to protect your reputation and that of the researchers, to say that we have to state the limitations of any study that we report on. And you'll find, if you want to find out what were the limitations of a particular study and why we can't jump to certain conclusions, the researchers will have probably put it there in the discussion section of their scientific papers. So don't depend on the press release, which will hardly give you any idea of the limitations of the study. And that, you know, gets automatically, uh, that lack of attention to the limitations of the study will go into the news story where you get screaming headlines and sometimes misleading uh, leads. Uh, but do go to the discussion section of the documents and uh, talk to experts to make sense of it. So um, I'd just like to end with two slides. One is that there is a growing need uh, to understand this whole aspect of the health effect of salinity associated with uh, groundwater along the coastal regions. Um, in the Bay of Bengal, we need more evidence-based reporting and that's, uh, that we can use to really stimulate informed debate. As we know, there are several naysayers and denialists, so we really need more evidence around this and that evidence has to be presented in a non-distorted, absolutely balanced way. Uh, there needs to be stories that can talk to uh, what a health risk of the water salinity means to communities, to someone who's working in a shrimp farm uh, and uh, those who live along the coast. Uh, we need to do kind of the kind of reporting uh, supported by data that can help governments to frame sensitive policies and mitigation strategies. So I'll just end with this. Um, it's sometimes very difficult to make sense of all the data and the qualifiers. So we need to work with researchers to understand what the data refers to. And we can take expert help. So make friends with all the resource people that you can think of and identify and list out the, all the uh, you know, experts who are working in this domain so that there's a little black book of names that you can go to when we want some help to understand that study. And uh, I would say strongly work with the expert to help craft your messages because by the time the data becomes information and the information becomes a message, there's a lot of uh, something lost in the translation. So we need to not create panic, but we really need discourse. The reason why I'm saying not to create panic is because it's easier to deny if there's a gross exaggeration of the available data and the information. Uh, I also think it's very uh, useful to uh, report on the multifactorial effects of the health effects. You'll really get some rich uh, studies. So that whole complex tapestry of interaction among all the factors that end up putting a woman on the table and making her have convulsive seizures. We really need to track it back where she lives, the kind of job she does, what kind of oppression she faces at home, what her daily diet consists of and what her genetic history is like. I think we need to bring in all of those things to put the whole thing in context in the minds of the readers. And I think put a human face on the stories we tell. It's uh, the science is about human beings and how we can better our lives. Otherwise there's no real uh, value to it in many ways. So we need to understand uh, how we can uh, talk to communities in a way that not only makes them say what, but so, and they shouldn't say so what. What does it mean to me is a very, very important aspect of this. And I also think it's important to understand how communities are themselves evolving ways to uh, counteract this problem. What are the small scale best practices that they have come out with? And I think that's not covered very well in the, in the mainstream media. So with these thoughts, I'll leave you and then uh, look forward to joining the discussion later. And I hope I haven't exceeded my time. Over to you, Jaydeep. Thank you so much, Jaya. It was so rich. And it really helps when a doctor is a journalist. It really yeah. does. <laughs> yes. Uh, right. Uh, OK, before we go to the next speaker, I have a request to all the speakers who have spoken already. We have so many questions in the Q&A section that if we are going to answer all of them live, we'll be here for days. So 
can you please start answering those who have already spoken if you would please start answering those questions uh, within that box you can you have the ability to answer now we move to the next speaker and i'm very happy that mr shubhrato roy has joined us we were very keen given the situation that we have been seeing for the last 3 years we are very keen that medical and paramedical workers who are actually working first hand with coastal communities come and speak of their experiences which is exactly what mr shubhrato roy is he is a medical assistant working with a very well known ngo called ledars in bangladesh he is based near shamnagar in shatkhira district of bangladesh and now he is going to talk to us he prefers to speak in bengali and he is uh, while he speaks my colleague zubaidur rahman sweb is going to run his presentation in english and wherever mr roy says something that is outside the presentation uh, then uh, sweb will translate sweb you are what you are showing right now is the bengali uh, presentation would you like to show the english presentation is this what uh, mr roy is this uh, uh, what you are uh, sharing uh, uh, okay the bengali uh, for now bengali for shubhrato will be good i will translate and i will share the english version with everyone okay all right okay go ahead go ahead mr roy all yours dhonnobad shokalke ami ashole ekhane leaders e kaj kori ei alakay holo sundorboner khubi kaj theke ekdom upoler pasabashi ekta jaygay আমি যেখানে অবস্থান করছি সেখান থেকে প্রায় পাঁচ মিনিট সময় লাগে হেঁটে যেতে এলাকায় তো সেই সুবাদে এ এলাকার মানুষের খুব কাজ থেকে তাদের সাথে কাজ করার সুযোগ হয়েছে তো আমাদের সুন্দরবন সব দুর্যোগ বুকে আগলে নিয়ে এই সুবিশাল বন অঞ্চল বাঁচিয়ে রেখেছে আমাদের উপকূলীয় অঞ্চল এবং মানুষকে So my name is Shubhrato Roy, and uh, I work in Shamnagar, uh, very close to the um, world's largest mangrove forest. It's like a walking distance, five minutes walking distance from the place where I live in. Um, so from that uh, part of the country, uh, that part of the world, I welcome you all to this uh, presentation. And this Sundarbans has been has been saving us, uh, saving Bangladesh and, uh, and millions of people from. cyclones and other disasters uh, so welcome everyone ji dada ji so sundorboner kul ghese konnomoti tike ache chotto ekti gram mothurashpur jele polli ottonto koshchokpodo ei grame koto doridro jele sampradayer beche thakar ashroy sundorbon ar ashpashe choriye thaka ojoshro chingri ar kakrar ghir ar shei sathe বছর বছর বন্যা আর ঘূর্ণি জরে তান্ডবের সাথে লড়াই করে টিকে থাকা যেন এক আশ্চর্য বাস্তবতা সো थैंक यू সুপ্রভাত দা সেফুস हैव अ लुक एट दिस विलेज दिस विलेज इज वेरी क्लोज टू द फॉरेस्ट एंड मोस्ट ऑफ द इनहेबिटेंट्स ऑफ दिस विलेज आर फिशरमैन द वेरी पुअर एंड मार्जिनलाइज फिशरमैन एज यू कैन सी द हाउसेस एंड सी यू कैन सी अ वुमन um washing uh, her dishes uh, in the river and the second photo as you can see um uh, there is no green fields actually it's they have all taken over by the <clears throat> crab and shrimp uh, farming um so this is what the place where these poor people live in and the name of this village is mutrapur fisherman village thank you dada অত্যন্ত পশ্চাৎপদ এই গ্রামে হতদরিদ্র জেলে সম্প্রদায়ের বেঁচে থাকার আশ্রয়স্থল সুন্দরবন আর আশপাশে ছড়িয়ে ছিটে থাকা অজস্র চিংড়ি আর কাঁকড়ার ঘের আর সেই সাথে বছর বছর বন্যা আর ঘূর্ণি জরে তাণ্ডব লড়াই করে টিকে থাকা যেন এক আশ্চর্য বাস্তবতা সো দ্য পিপল অফ দিস ভিলেজ এন্ড লাইক ইন মোস্ট অফ দিস কোস্টাল ভিলেজেস দে লাইক স্ট্রাগলিং Uh, um, and coping with the cyclones and disasters salinity and everything and poverty it's like a part of their it's part of their life 
um, every year they have cyclones and other natural disasters. And you can see the next slide, uh, Fisherman House, Dada Bolan. Uh, the district. So, yeah, Bolan. Hello. Hadji Bolan. It's a, the impact of salinity on human health in coastal Bangladesh. The Jolobaya Puri Vartanar Phole, Lobonatto Virechu Bokuli Alakai. Our Matra Turito, Isho Bluna Pani Dunundin Bavari Phole, Jora Shankranta Vivinaruge, Akron Tokshin Isho Velaka Narida. Dilgudin, Lobon Pani Pan Korar Phole, Narida Dekadice, Jora Pradaho, Jora Urgha, Ita Diru. Japoro Botite, cancer ticket, Teledite Pare. Ejon Nolpova, she is or located with the Baddo Hotchen, on a gnari. Hole, on a Kashanshari Gibone de Hadith Soshanti. A monkey be bow with Chet Kuzan to Gurchi. Thank you, brother. So uh, we uh, skipped uh, two, three slides. Let me just go back to those slides and share like one or two sentences. Um, so the village uh, that we are referring here is like 71. Uh, more than 71 kilometers uh, away from the district headquarters. And the district uh, southern hospital that we say, the main hospital is in the district town. So if anyone falls sick, um, so Dr. Google is saying like it takes 2.45 uh, hours to reach to uh, the southern hospital by car, but these people do not have car at sea. Uh, what is their medical conditions, health conditions, and health services they get. Um, in that situation, what um, we have a video that we will show later. Um, so in that situation, what um, um, uh, Subrato was trying to say, like because of the increase of the salinity in the coastal regions, uh, women um, use this water daily, and they are being affected by a number of diseases especially their reproductive system, uh, some of which have moved in, as we have seen, like moved to, into cancer. Many women are being forced by this to opt for uh, history uh, 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 what, what is it? This is a medical term, his, hysteria, to, to mice, uh, history, I think. Hysteria so this problems. is leading to unrest. Yeah, yeah so a sort of an unrest. Um, in many cases, they we have seen we have seen breakup of marriages, um, yeah, in many many families. Dada. Kom pani pan or lovon pani pavare phole mudronale infection zoni to roge bhuksi onik nari purush. We know like women uh, in those um, regions, they actually drink less water. And they always use this silent water. Uh, so many, many, many women and girls, and also um, their male counterparts, are also suffering from urinary um, tract infections. Upokuli alakar onek nari purush jibika nirbahir jonno nudi te maz dorte jai. Nudiir pani lobo nakto hoar karone tadir jono angat sulka nishoh onek rup dekha dicche. Tasar eshob alakar nari u kishiri ra. Mashike Shoma Bavarito, Kapor, Lobon Panita Tui, Abor Shiti Bavarkori, Polanana Dronel, Jonor Gakra to Hontara. So uh, uh, they spent, like the people living in those uh, parts of the world, spent many hours in brackish water. Um, and, uh, and, and this salinity um, problem leads to a number of skin diseases. Uh, many of them wash sanitary napkins in the same water and wear those napkins again, which leads to more urinary tract uh, uh, infections. Uh, uh, just to add to um, Subroto, the, recently we have heard that um, in Satkira and other coastal districts, many teenage girls um, are taking kind of a medicine that stops their menstruation process because they don't want to use the saline water uh, because they know like they have to use saline water. So they are forcing them to stop um, their menstruation cycle, um, which is very alarming. Yeah. Yeah. 
লিপুরায় ভুগছে শিশু থেকে কিশোরীরা ও নারীরা এখানকার অধিকাংশ মানুষ এক একটা পুকুরে দুইশো থেকে তিনশো জন পর্যন্ত গোসল করে তাছাড়া গবাদি পশু গোসল করানো কাপড় কাঁচা থালা বাসন ধোয়া সবই চলে একই পুকুরে আবার দারিদ্রতা ও অশিক্ষার কারণে পরিষ্কার পরিচ্ছন্ন সম্পর্কেও তারা সচেতন নন ফলে সাদা স্রাবের মতো রোগে ভুগে থাকেন তারা so the leukorea is a most one of the most common diseases among women and girls um in 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 the coastal bangladesh uh, most people and uh, and their domestic animals are forced to use water from the same pond that they use for swimming and drinking um so uh, we lack of sanitation problem and lack of sanitation awareness um, among this among this people um, um, in many cases due to their poverty and illiteracy ji lobon pani byabohar er phole eshobekar manushera nana dhoroner charmo roge bhoge thaken bishesh kore narira karon tader doinondin kaaje lobon pani beshi byabohar korte hoy oneke shorire pray sara bochori charmo rog thake oneke rate bhalo kore ghumate parena chulkanir karone বিশেষ করে তারা খুস পাস্রা দাউর ইসকাবিস স্কিন র্যাস ইত্যাদি জাতীয় রোগে বেশি ভোগে থাকে ইট লুকস লাইক ক্যান ইউ ক্যান ইউ হিয়ার মি ইয়া নাও উই ক্যান হিয়ার ওকে সরি সরি আ লিটল ডিসরাপশন ইয়া সো বিকজ অফ বিকজ দে ইজ Uh, the the people living in the coastal districts use a lot of saline water for different purposes especially women the care work um, um because they are in our, in in those families women and girls are responsible um i mean i mean the responsibility goes to women and girls to bring water for the family and cooking washing everything uh, uh, are done by women and girls mostly in most cases so they uh, you know they have uh, skin diseases like all time different kind of skin diseases like scabies and other 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 type of um skin diseases and mostly we see those type diseases um among women and girls otirikto lobon pani paner phole garbhavati mayader khichuni u uchcha rakta rasiber har beshi dekha dicche tar phole ghorche garbhavater moto ghotona so uh so since uh, the entire area uh, entire region is saline um, uh, the water sources have become saline um, so women especially the pregnant women they have to drink water and they drink saline water which um, increases the uh, blood pressure so they they always have high blood pressure um, and in many many cases we have seen like they are having miscarriages as a result of um, high pressure high blood pressure প্রতিনিয়ত লবণ অর্থাৎ বাড়ার কারণে উপকূলীয় গ্রামগুলিতে ফসল ফলে না বললেই চলে চারিদিকে শুধু মাছ আর কাঁকড়ার ভিড় বাণিজ্যিক উৎপাদন হওয়ার সবার ভাগ্যে সেসব মাছ জুটেও না আর মাছ জুটলেও পুষ্টিকর শাক সবজি ও ফলমূলের ঘাটতি আছে ব্যাপক পর্যাপ্ত ঘাস ও মিষ্টি পানির অভাবে হাঁস মুরগি ও গরম আশঙ্কা কম ফলে তারা ডিম ও দুধ থেকে বঞ্চিত ফলে এসব এলাকার জনগোষ্ঠী বিশেষ করে শিশু কিশোর কিশোরীরা গর্ভবতী uh which is to be there before 20 25 years ago so there is no um cropping uh, apart from this uh, fish uh, i mean shrimp and uh, uh, crab farming um so they don't grow vegetables and these things um uh, that's why like they always have a lack of balanced diet um in their daily meals um which results in having um uh, this anemia and malnutrition especially the children um, and pregnant women are very like very much vulnerable to this to this 
particular kind of uh, um, uh, I mean, health condition. Tushito pani paner karone manus nana dhorone pete roshuke bhukse thil ko thil kore. Isho bala kar manus share acidity samosa, diarrhea, amoshoy, typhoid jor legi thake. Onike lovan pani bevar korar karone chokhir shongke man bhukse. Tasara lovan akto pani bevar karone onike kom pani pan kore thake. Bolle tarak pushto karinor motoruke pai bhukse. So um, uh, the saline water not only causes uh, chronic. Uh, stop. Sorry. So uh, let me. Uh, there is a technical problem, but let me explain what you have said. Uh, saline water not only causes chronic diseases of the digestive tract; it also affects eyesight. Many drink less water than they should because. And the water is salty, and that causes constipation. Mithapan ne kukur dure hoy, ona ke lavan pani te gusal koren. Pole dhire dhire ta der sul puri ratse, sul hotse rukho, ebang ona ke sul lalse akar tharam kors. Ek tu bekha. So the other problem is like many, many men and women and children suffer hair losses. Um, their hairs are turning red um, and, 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 and it becomes so rough. Um, yeah. পরিবারের সদস্যদের বিভিন্ন রোগ গর্ভবতী মায়েদের অকাল গর্ভপাত ও শিশুদের অকাল মৃত্যু এবং চিকিৎসা করার অতিরিক্ত বাই এই এলাকার মানুষের সব সময় দুধ দুধ চিন্তার মধ্যে থাকতে হয় ফলে অনেকেই মানসিক ভাবে ভেঙে পড়েন Okay, I'll translate that. What uh, Subrata was saying was that all this, especially the ever-increasing cost of healthcare, is leading to mental illnesses among many residents. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Ji, brother. Ita amader apnar dekhte bolchen. Ita amader leader sir. একটা রিভার অ্যাম্বুলেন্স যেটা দিয়ে আমরা প্রত্যন্ত গ্রামগুলিতে দ্বীপ অঞ্চলগুলিতে প্রাথমিক স্বাস্থ্য সেবা প্রদান করে থাকি একদম প্রান্তিক পর্যায়ে আর ফার্স্ট ছবিটাতে দেখা যাচ্ছে যে লবণ পানি তাদের বসবাসের জায়গাগুলোতে কিভাবে প্রবেশ করেছে এবং তারা খাওয়ার পানি আনার জন্য কত কষ্ট করতে হয় তাদের I mean, Subrata's organization used to go to these remote places and help these people, provide them health services. As you have seen, like this are some of the remotest part of the country. Uh, the government services uh, are not essentially there. Um, so it takes like um, four or five hours to, for, for, a, for a man or woman to go to the hospital. And in many cases, we have seen like, uh, I mean, there are no doctors. Uh, so people um, depend on um, uh, people like Subroto. And what I have heard from many, many people that these uh, poor people uh, consider people like Subroto as gods um, because they are the people, Subroto and like him, they are the people who always stand um, beside them. Um, and this, the picture that I am showing is... It's not a picture of a pond or a river. It's a village underwater, uh, and and it's 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 been underwater for for many years. Yeah, it's because of the sea level rise. And the other picture that we wanted to see uh, show you is this road. Um, so uh, now you can imagine like how far is the medical government provided medical services from them. Um, 
so yeah that's it we thank thank you um, and if you have any question uh, shubhutu da can answer or there will be a q a session where shubhutu da can talk thank you very much thank you very much mr roy and thank you very much roy uh onek dhonobad apnake uh i yes please stay on because i can see that there are many questions for you i can also see that uh, we are running late so i'm going straight on to the speaker who's going to put it all together the speaker who's going to put it all together is dr upashana ghosh she works at the indian institute of public health bhubaneswar center she is a social anthropologist who has been working with these coastal communities on these these very issues and she's going to tell us about her experiences now dr ghosh over to you yeah thank you so much uh, is my screen visible yes okay yes it is yeah so so everybody uh, i mean uh, you have all all the time you have listened to all those experts uh, my previous speakers about um, you know how the salinity is impacting the health of the people what are the coastal climates and what are the impacts now uh, just just uh, let's think about the community which are living there and how they are thinking about their situation so uh, just just to sum just to summing up all this uh, all the health and salinity on their livelihood so who are the people in this entire bengal delta comprising the sundarbans as a whole from bangladesh and from india so first of all we need to understand you know this this particular region was very self sufficient in terms of producing uh, agricultural products like vegetables uh, and uh, the paddy though it was always a monocropic uh, um, field but it was very productive now what is happening due to this climatic changes and especially the salinity intrusions in the agricultural field that the self sufficient economy of these people is turning towards a market dependent economy so this there is a transition in the livelihood and the economy farmers the fishers are became the wage laborers there is a they, they they were food producers now they became the food consumers so that is a big change big change in the entire system of the sundarbans then the, the population in this two delta in this entire bengal delta in two countries they are always in uh, you know that they are always in a in a uh transitions in a mobility there are inter island trans uh, transitions there are inter uh, i mean intra island transitions because of their land erosions uh, their uh, destructions of their homes uh, agricultural land erosions so they they always have to have in a move there are rural to urban transitions like in bangladesh sundarbans lot of uh, you know people they have already my towards the urban uh, settings there are interstate uh, migrations uh, especially in the indian part of sundarbans like from the sundarbans people are moving as a wage laborer migrated laborer towards uh, uh, kerala delhi many other states there are of course a uh, inter country the trans boundary trans uh, migrations that is there that is you as a journalist know we as a researchers know so that that is there. so what i try to say here the there is a population which is always mobile at present the further transitions they this particular people were the nature worshippers they have you know developed bondi and the legend of uh, bondi as a as a cultural syncretism despite of their religious identity but now this as this nature harnessing people are turning towards you know wage laborers became the climatic refugee their entire religious orientation their cultural orientation is also changed and of course there is a reverse migration due to covid-19 situation 
both in both in india and bangladesh that situation is also there and then they they face the climatic events like amphan in 2000 in may 2020 and they couldn't move out uh, of the island because of the uh, because of the covid situation so they are the population who are trapped within this rural urban life dynamics because there are impact of globalization impact of urbanization towns are aggressive i mean uh, progressing towards uh, the sundarbans so this population you know in a, in a in a continuous complex state of mind and they are living with the uncertainties in their daily life if we are talking about uh, their their uh, daily life we are talking about health we are talking about their i mean ground level water level but what they are doing what the communities are doing they are absolutely in a mess in a uncertain situation if a person every day has to wake up and have to think that how i am going to feed my family today to livelihood options it's a complete mess so they are in a that situation so now how how this entire situation that i said uh, uh, earlier how how it is impacting on health it is basically what we were talking about it's basically the social determinants of this the of the health and nutrition of this particular populations as you all know that climate change impacts like as as we if we take salinity relations as a as a by product as a manifestations of climate change it has two types of impacts in the sundarbans one is the sudden impacts like floods cyclones another is a gradual but slow impacts like erosions erratic rainfall drought continuous inundations so of course it has as uh, dr sridhar has already mentions and uh, shubhoda has already mentions the entire health impact i'm not going to go in details with that there are of course when is a direct impact like amphan or ayla or nargis whichever the cyclone it increases the water borne disease crop loss shelter uh, loss uh, loss of the health infrastructures and seasonal mail out migration as a coping while there is a gradual shocks it has land loss agricultural uh, land uh, demolition non communicable diseases fish catch displacement i mean there are continuously impacts our people are facing these impacts now whether these impacts are equally distributed all over the region i said no because this impacts how how much vulnerable a household is in the sundarbans with this for this impact is depending upon their certain sensitivity factors what are the sensitivity factors the first of all their geographic location as we all know that uh, sundarbans has three kind of you know geographic locations um, it's a one, some parts are totally man made land like the blocked by the the uh, totally land lock some are entirely deltaic portions some pockets have semi deltaic uh, in nature so this geographic locations is very important for a household to be sensitive in in terms of this kind of impacts what are the social uh, dynamics of course their gender caste religion and of course their livelihood factors that are the sensitivity factors the social which determine the social vulnerability of a particular community or a household whether how much impact they are getting from this climatic changes or salinity inundations everything so now of course the community is trying to cope and the system as well so if we put the 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 communities response the resources and the individual response towards these changes along with the social security and as well as the healthcare systems capability it somehow giving a you know backup to this uh, to the health impact or the nutrition impact of the community of or the households so what i have tried to put here uh, it's like what are the pathways by which this entire situations of salinity inundation or impact on livelihood or health is impacting the people's uh, situation i mean if i don't have any 
option other than drinking my uh, drinking the saline water that is my biggest vulnerability i know it is harmful for my health but do i have any other option so uh, we did on uh, with the mothers of uh, the indian sundarbans uh, it's called a photo voice project and we gave cameras to the mothers uh, of very young children uh, to capture their you know perceptions about the social determinants of their child health so with our surprise uh, they came up with you know excellent photographs so i am i would like to present some of the photographs captured by the mothers of sundarbans uh, here so first they are saying you know in the in the first photograph you may say that's the woman is capturing her peer as a crab catcher they know that this is a very strenuous hazardous time taking livelihood but they do not have any other option because they lost their agriculture Mindhar or a prawn seed collection. We all know that the you know Sundarbans women were traditionally Mindhar. They they were traditional fisher women. But this livelihood is still in danger, and they have to stand in the saline water. And the health impacts we have already uh, listened from Dr. Sridhar and Shubhoda. The third photograph. These people, this community, know that you know the rural medical practitioners are their. <laughs> they that of course they know the harmful effect of the the woman walk but they still have to because their husbands are out migrated and the mothers are left with the children in the sundarbans and they don't have any other resources other than going to the uh, going to the quacks so this is this is a kind of health determinants what i'm trying to present from the lens of the mothers if we see the next photograph this is again uh, you know captures by the woman this is that the road leading towards our health center getting devastated every with every tidal surge so how can we go to uh, go to seek health care we know we are sick we know we have problems but how and to what ways we will go to seek care if we talk Uh, you know potable water access to the to the drinkable water a woman or a or a islander of the sundarbans have to go in a uh, you can see the third photograph that they have to go and fetch a potable water like this this kind of situation so that is th these are the ground realities by which people when we ask the mothers that what what are the adaptive strategies what what are you doing how you are coping with this uh, problem so there are some astonishing pictures you know they said that one mother says that i have to leave my younger child with the elder one i know it's a very risky affair but i have to, i do not have any other option i have to leave that i have to leave that child with uh, my younger child who is, who is also again uh, you know 8 9 years old there are traditional belief and practices but still they for for the common elements they are still practicing those home remedies those uh, you know traditional beliefs like going to a uh, ojha or gunin and the traditional healer or a faith that is the most available option for them that is the most viable option for them because the health facility is you know if they, if, if they want to go to a health facility they have to cross two rivers and the entire daily wage will be will be lost it's an opportunity cost they have to pay to go to a proper health care to go to seek for a proper health care so all this comes what i'm trying to say that we are talking about uh, you know about the health of the people we need to count all these factors if we try to impress policy like the the ngos or the cbos in the sundarbans they have major initiatives in both the country some i have listed there are many others salinity resistant crops brackish aquaculture crab cultivation training of the girls women there are a lot of things going on i mean this is the most you know uh, i i always said during the research that this is the most development it is there in both the both the, both the sundarbans but what we try to 
trying to prove. We still don't know what is the extent of impact of health and nutrition these people are facing. There is no research, no empirical data, no ground level data. What people really need, these people are very, very resilient people. They had, you know, facing climatic shock and situations for long. Though climate change has, you know, increased this uh, phase for last few years, but they are facing, they are, they are the resilient people. But resiliency have must have a you know uh, you know a boiling point. They have they are still bouncing back with their coping strategies. But how to what extent they would they can they can do it? Because the shocks are not going to be less in in foreseeable future. And how much the health system can bear the shock? Do we ever think about from the policy uh, implementers perspective, what they need, what the ASHA workers, the Anganwadi workers, or the a who are delivering the health uh, care there, they also have something to say. So it should be a combination of both the supply side and the community side perceptions that we need to push, or you, I will urge you uh, as journalists to push the policymakers through your stories towards like that, that don't think in silos, think about as a holistic approach. It's a very, the Bengal Delta in both the countries is a very dynamic, uh, with very dynamic population. It's a very complex, uh, you know, uh, transition, social, economic, ecological transition is going on in the Sundarbans. So, we, we cannot think like, you know, yeah, we need to do some uh, health uh, intervention. We need to do some uh, 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 groundwater intervention. No, we cannot do that. We need to think a holistic planning or simply a disaster management. We think beyond that disaster management or disaster mitigation can be an entry point to, to uh, you know, understand this, uh, this uh, impact but we should think beyond disaster management. We should think the long-term resiliency of the people, both in terms of health, in terms of their livelihood, in terms of their social determinants. Uh, I would like to stop here. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to, I'm happy to you know, uh, answer your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Ghosh. Well, uh, as you can see, this was an extremely rich, uh, presentation, like all the presentations were extremely rich. In the process, what has happened is that we're running horribly late. That was bound to happen, I suspect, because when there are, the presentations are so rich and I was totally against the idea of stopping any of these presenters because I could see the, from the number of questions, the level of interest. Uh, I was very interested myself. Okay, so what has happened in the process is that we have possibly lost the time for an open discussion on story ideas, but we haven't lost the time for Q&A. We haven't lost the time for uh, telling you about story grants, which will allow, enable you to take this whole thing forward. Let me first tell you about the story grants. Please uh, let me share this. Yeah. Uh, Right. Uh, please go to this website, uh, to this page on the Earth Journalism Network website, which I shall uh, I shall also share the URL on the chat with you. Uh, and then uh, put in your applications. The last date is the end of this month. Please put in your applications. There is some. There is a big. I know many of you have got story grants under this project before. So especially for them, uh, there is a difference. Because of COVID-19, we definitely don't want you to go all over the place and uh, expose yourself to the possibility of infection uh, or very importantly, expose the communities to the possibility of infection. So uh, please do your stories as far as possible and we definitely prefer you to be, do your stories now over the phone and over the desk. You can actually do a lot of this over the phone and through desk work. I'll give you one example in which I know we are very interested. We have been hearing 
today we have been doing stories for the last 3 years on health effects we still can't find any say even a district data suppose i want to see how many extra pre eclampsia cases are in nellore district of andhra pradesh where do i get that data i think our ability to check that and do a story on that is just as much if not more from the desk for rti applications if necessary as by going to the field by going to the field we can talk to the people but this this kind of information i think we can get from the desk and the, the it's the stories of resilience the sol of solutions that we are specially looking for and stories with a lot of data backing okay so please do that i'm going to share this with you i'm going to stop sharing my screen and having done that i'm going to share this uh, url oh yeah which uh, yeah my colleague has already done so you can do that right i'm going to go back to the speakers uh, starting i can see that dr zahid is still connecting that's fine so let's start with dr borman uh, sir over to you for a the uh, if there are any outstanding questions and b what, what your uh, concluding remarks but before any of the speakers start their uh, answers and the concluding remarks let me tell everybody that uh, what i have said on the chat box to others will definitely request all speakers to share their presentations so that we can in turn share them with all participants we will also request all speakers to share their email ids so that we can share them with all participants over to you dr borman thank you uh, i try to give the answers uh, raised by the many people uh, some of the uh, things uh, they are talking about in terms of data but i have to see and i may be answer later uh, overall i can uh, tell you that uh, coastal area we know it's a very very uh, complex situations so far agriculture uh, productivity is concerned it depends on the many many factors particularly uh, so much uh, climate change scenario uh it's uh, happening a lot of changes is happening in the coastal areas but i can tell you that a uh, lot of technological option is available for the farmers uh for to cope up this uh, situation and to increase the agriculture productivity in the coastal region and particularly to manage the salinity also farmers are doing so but in a few areas due to some constraints particularly some institutional problems or uh, dissemination of technology to the farmers or uh, accessibility of the particular area or availability of you know, inputs for the farmers those are uh, some of the constraints for the agriculture uh, productivity uh, but the government has taken many initiative and we are uh, some since the government organization though we have the limited uh, manpower particularly we are in agriculture research scientists we are uh, working with uh, many ngos particularly in the coastal area so that uh, we try to convey our research findings or technology to those people so that that can be uh, reach easily to the farmers we are also sharing our uh, means uh, technology and findings to the government uh, departments those who are working uh, with the people particularly extension work and all those and many kbk uh, krishi vigyan kendras are working throughout the country even in the coastal area they are very active particularly i tell you that in the sundarban area two kbk under uh, ramakrishna ashram and uh, narendrapur ramakrishna ashram they are working they are very very active and we are trying to solve the farmers problems and trying to help the farmers for the agriculture productivity but overall in future scenario we are uh, continuing our research keeping in view the changing scenario uh, definitely 
will be many products as coming particularly crop variety many development has been uh, going on particularly rice you know rice is a very uh, uh, major dominant crop in the crop so a lot of changes uh, has been uh, in the biotechnological sector and other sector we are working with the close uh, contact with the international organization particularly the rice institute so that we can develop a good product for the coastal area and for the agriculture development thank you very much thank you thank you very much dr barman right uh, i know uh, dr sridhar has another meeting to a uh, uh, starting in another what six minutes so over to you jaya you're muted there were a couple of questions on on cervical cancer and uh, salinity but i'm afraid i don't have the data they pertain to bangladesh so i would ask one of the bangladeshi participants to sort of uh, throw some light on that i don't have enough data on that right okay any is there any other question or any other reaction from you jay yeah uh, there was a uh, there was a general question on the health effects and i think uh, it was all covered in my slides so i'm happy to share that uh, other than that i i you know really wanted to appreciate this uh, you know sort of a rounded uh, perspectives coming from everybody and i really think that uh, a story on health should uh, speak to all of the experts on this panel so that you know um you know we get a real all all the perspectives in i think it's really key uh, and i also wanted to flag up one more thing there's not really not enough data that's going around and available to uh, present a very uh, rounded perspective we have to really say that we need more data in certain areas and uh, i asked my co-panelists to sort of respond to that and and you as well uh, joyi yeah yeah this is the problem that we have been facing it's not that we have not been trying to do stories all the participants here they've been trying to do, do these stories i know this i i know that uh, after the workshop in vizag we had a lot of journalists go in kakinada in nellore in vizag uh, trying to figure out okay uh, is uh, can we see any relationship between this increasing salinity and preeclampsia can we establish a relationship now how do you establish that unless health and wellness centers are keeping preeclampsia case data that, so that's that, the... that is the problem so i think we as journalists should get more aggressive about seeking such information exactly so if if the health and wellness centers are not keeping this information what i am asking my colleagues to do perhaps even through these grants is ask the district medical officer if he doesn't have it as the chmo don't stop it as the health minister in your state because yes, we need to get this data out absolutely um, yeah. like uh, mr sainath did uh, when there was yeah. a positive malaria data you know his investigation involved him going house to house to get uh, you know uh, do verbal autopsies from the families to get an idea of malarial deaths and uh, symptoms of malaria so we might end up having to do that in small communities and present an enough evidence and try and relate it to whatever else the health system gives us we, we yeah we have been doing that in our own small ways that uh, yes we have been going to the communities talking to them asking them okay what was the problem uh, what did the doctor tell you then they tell us but then we are not getting that corroboration from the doctor that 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 is becoming the problem and that is what we need uh, otherwise for things like you know groundwater salinity uh, we, there was an excellent story done with one of the grants by one of the journalists uh, because he went around actually collecting water samples took them to a test house got the got the water samples tested as simple as that so you can do that with groundwater salinity you can do that with soil but you can't do that with health you can you can't take you know people and take them to a test house so that becomes a problem with the health health stories we'll have to figure out how to sort this out but let me ask the same question to shubhrato uh, the shubhrato our question to you is apni kimba apnar kono sahajogi ap koto jon mohila aschen pre eclampsia niye koto jon mohila aschen 
রক্তচাপের নিয়ে এই রেকর্ড রাখেন আপনারা so what i asked subrato in bengali was do they keep records of the number of women coming to him uh, with uh, blood pressure issues or pre eclampsia etc subrato over to you subrata apni unmute kore bolen hello ha shunte pacchi shunte pachchen ha bol ji ji জি আমরা অবশ্যই রেকর্ডটা রাখি আর কি কতজন বাংলাদেশ that ledars is an is an ngo which does a lot of work along the coastal regions so this is another source of authenticated health data so uh, because they are running these clinics themselves i i suspect that other bangladeshi large ngos like bcas or brac may also be running similar things so if you are having trouble getting medical data from the government check out the clinics run by ngos so i know it is there's going to be a problem with it that it may be disputed by the government but at least you are not working in a vacuum morning to nobody should go yeah yeah jaya go ahead yeah, i just wanted to add that there are small focus studies and you know of you know 100 people or 124 people in a community and i still think those are worth highlighting in the mainstream media uh, go visit those places talk to the researchers and just desist from extrapolating the findings or uh, uh, you know sort of drawing parallels with the national level data or state level data uh, don't distort it that way but just uh, flag up these small very very important compact studies and really put a human face on it might be a good way to sort of uh, uh, you know bring the issue into the spotlight you have got yourself into trouble please add a slide with the links to these studies when you share the slides with us i shall do that uh, i was very careful about the data i didn't you know sort of i desisted from putting too many percentages and proportions because it was so patchy but whatever i refer to there's a whole list i will share those that's yeah. quite a bit okay great great thank you very much okay oh, uh, i know we are already over time Dr. Ghosh, over to you for answering any of the questions that you wish to answer and the, your concluding words. Yeah, so uh, I, don't, I am not seeing any uh, burning question at present, but uh, definitely I would like to uh, mention about the data gap we are talking about. Um, I would like to share my experience. Uh, yesterday, I was um, you know, uh, giving an interview for a big data, uh, for a big research grant. I don't want to wish to mention the name of the international grants, but you know what they say, I, my research I wanted to do is on the climate change impact on the nutrition, child nutrition in the Sundarbans. So uh, the, the panel is there, they mentioned that, you know, your research is very complex and we are not sure whether you will be able to do that. So, my perception as a researcher in fact you we are talking here about the journalist even for a researcher who is spending 10 years in and researching in this region i was surprised that you know how you can say that i should do a simpler research if i still cannot do cannot get a grant to do a you know complex uh, analysis of this uh, things like climate change impact on child nutrition it's very unfortunate so this is you know this is the kind of situation here we we are we are facing every day who want to do work with the community be a researcher be a, a journalist so that that perception is totally it's very unfortunate but we definitely have to come out of that and we have to do our bit so uh, we we uh, i will urge all of you to you know think in think getting out of the box 
do talk to the community, do talk to all the stakeholders, researchers, uh, health officials, whoever possible, and try to put this issue, flag this issue, because data is definitely very, very scanty, patchy, scratchy, everything. So uh, th this is this is maybe the possible future. So thank you, that's thank you, thank you, Dr. Gush. That's that's useful. Uh, I have a specific request for you as well. Please add one slide to your presentation before you share with a link to the film that you wanted to show and we didn't have time for. So this is for everybody uh, that uh, uh, she, she, there's a very good film that Dr. Ghosh wanted to show us. Unfortunately, we are already running over time. So I, she very graciously agreed to my request to defer that. So so that participants can see it, please add a link to that. And in fact, whatever the research I have already done on health and climate change or the salinity. Yeah, if you please I, put the I, links I, of all those papers, I, that will be very helpful. Yeah, definitely. And I also wish to draw the attention of all participants, all colleagues, that there are some colleagues among us uh, who also know of similar studies, research. I can right now see in the chat box there a link uh, on a study that uh, about salinity and preeclampsia that has been put up by our colleague abu siddiq thank you abu for that thank you very much right okay uh, i know that uh, people wanted to ask more questions but as i said we are already over 2 hours so i i'm afraid we are going to take all the other questions offline this is uh, definitely don't think your questions will not be answered or not be discussed. But since given the time, let's do it offline. Thank you very much for all your questions. Keep them coming. We shall keep coming back to you and apply for those story grants so that you can pursue this. Thanks to all speakers. Thanks to all participants. Have a good, good day. Bye. Thank you very much, Jadeep. Thanks to all my co-panelists and thanks to all the wonderful participants. All the best and happy story writing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Shumrutada. Thanks, everybody. Welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <coughs>